Hello, and welcome to another episode of the William Branham Historical Research Podcast. I'm your host, John Collins, the author and founder of William Branham Historical Research at william-branham.org. And with me is my co-host, researcher, minister, and friend, Charles Paisley, newly famous author. And today, we're discussing Charles' new book, Come Out of Her, My People. <laughs> Charles, it's so good to have you back, and everybody's been asking about you. I don't know if you have seen it in the comment feeds, but everybody's like, where's Charles? Why, why did you get rid of Charles? And I didn't get rid of Charles. Charles has been working on this great, thick book that I hold in my hand. Well, John, it, it is a little exciting to finally be done with, with the first volume, and you're right. I have been uh, – uh, life is so busy, I generally can only uh, manage so many projects at a single time, and so that's been uh, one of my projects here as of late, but I'm really zeroing in on getting that first – the first volume done, and um, the title, John, you know, where I come from in the message, um, if you said, what is the message, what is the message, a lot of us would say the message is – come out of her, my people. And so, hence the title of the book. This is what we would have said the message is in a lot of the places I come from. I don't know, was it that way in your churches too, John? Would you say the message is come out of her, my people? You know, I don't know. In some of them that I went to, the message was that God was tabernacled in human flesh in William Branham. But <laughs> I, I think you were supposed to believe it was come out of her, my people, because Charles, that's how every cult starts. You start with this big arms wide open. Hey, join us. We can be fun. We can be just as good as your church. And then once you get them sucked in, you say, come out of her, my people. And then they sever ties with whatever church they were in. And now you've got a new cult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've really enjoyed writing the book. You know, we went through, I went through a lot of the stuff that uh, we covered in our podcast series. Honestly, the, actually the show prep notes from the series is what started out as the initial manuscript for the book and a lot of this is the exact same stuff we went through in the ser in the podcast series but there was a few things I've done one thing I did is I've made sure that there's a French and a Spanish and a Portuguese translation available you know there's a lot of the X message community um that is in French Africa and in South America that do not speak English and so um, getting something available in in those languages was was something that was important for me to do um, to to be able to reach out to them. So there's there's foreign languages available. Those three: French, Spanish, and um, Portuguese. And then also, John, I I've taken time. Two things. One of the two things that I think I've done in this book, I've tried to do real well, is to walk through the relationship between the message and the latter rain movement, and to try and um, walk through how the message evolved both as a community and as a doctrinal theological system from latter rain roots and show how the two interact together. And I, I'm sure most of the listeners of the podcast remember, I am formerly the associate pastor of the second oldest message church. And our people were here, our families were here from, from the very beginning of all of this stuff. And so the, most message believers and most message churches came along in the 70s and 80s, to be honest, that are out there today. There's not actually a whole lot of message churches that have the roots back to the very earliest days of this, like uh, like my church did, John, or your church, the Tabernacle. And so we have a we, ha we have an ability to fill in a lot of blanks. I think that maybe um, some people would be interested to learn exactly how the message spun out of uh, the latter rain, both as a community and as a, as a set of beliefs. Yeah, there's so much there, and like like you said, the ones who are in the oldest groups they have a better perspective of what it used to be. I have been to some of the newer message churches, and honestly, if you go into them, you would. You know, you'd think they were just a regular Pentecostal church and until they mention that Branham guy and then you're scratching your head like, what is he talking about? And but for the most part, you know, some of the newer churches aren't that I don't know what the word is They're They're all semi destructive, but they aren't as destructive. I think I would say you go back further in time to some of the older sects and they are it's just unbelievable. Some of the things that they teach. You're right. This ideology, it. <clears throat> It, you ha you, it makes you progressively more radical. You know, it starts you out in a less radical state, but progressively the ideologies organize you become more 
radical, more radical, more radical. The oldest churches in the message tend to be the most radical <laughs> of the message, and then the younger ones less so. Uh, but given time, they catch up, right? <laughs> and so that that's just kind of the way the ideology works. You know, it's kind of the same with the uh, the New Apostolic Reformation and uh, the groups that you know were 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 set up in the later '80s and the '90s, right? As we see in the news today, what they're starting to catch up, right? Yeah. It just takes a little time because it's. <laughs> The way the ideology naturally evolves. It's like planting a bunch of weeds, man. You know, you can plant it as many times as you want and it's still going to grow a weed eventually. But that's how this that's how this thing is. And I'm working with a lot of people now who are in the very, very distant, you know, grandchildren, great grandchildren of the message. And I, in fact, I just had a, a recorded podcast just last night with somebody who was in the <clears throat> several different NAR groups. I won't go into specifics which ones, but they said that <laughs> right down to the prophecies that William Branham had, their leaders were regurgitating those same prophecies. One of them was the California sinking prophecy. And it was just mentioned casually, I think, in the movement. And, and she was like, I don't know where this come from. Why, why are they mentioning this? And then she discovered our research. and She's like, oh, my gosh, this man is just parroting Branham. And they're plagiarizing the things that he said, not even looking to see did they number one, did they even make sense? But number two, did they really come from God? And I think that that's the biggest problem. They don't critically evaluate William Branham. They just assume that he was this man of God because he's labeled as one of God's generals. Yeah, I know. It, it, it is a real shame, you know, because when you just take certain things for granted and you build a whole empire on it, um, you know, occasionally you have to look beneath your feet and try to figure out, is that sand down there or solid rock? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, you know, when we come out of the message, John, I mean, that's what we did. We looked down under there and we're like, oh, man, that's we got a lot of sand down there. <laughs> and so you start digging for rock. Right. And don't stop. You know, and that's I feel like that's what we have done in a lot of ways, John. We have yeah. dug until we hit solid rock. OK. And. There was a whole lot of sand between us and the rock, but I, I feel like, you know, we, we've, we've, we're getting close to bedrock now. And so I'm of the opinion that there was a lot of manure mixed in that sand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Litter box sand, huh? <laughs> yeah. I, I've tried in this book too, John, um, to, 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 to also show how the message was so embedded with the broader latter rain community that ended up spinning out also word of faith and um, new apostol that ended up leading into some of the new apostolic reformation stuff Paul Kane you know mentions in there and just try to bring it together to see how all this stuff um, how it's interconnected not just as a uh, you know, just saying it's connected, but showing the actual people were actually together and also showing how their ideologies were the same and how they took it and it, it evolved here and there. And you're right, John, so much of these, these NAR, New Apostolic Reformation groups, especially as you look at the Bethels of the world, as the IHOPs of the world, they are merely a, a, a a future evolution of this same ideology. They, they've they evolved it. It's grown over time. It's, it's mutated a little bit. I've really enjoyed the interviews you've been doing with uh, with some of the people from IHOP. Um, I, I love how uh, I think her name was, was Awen was her name? Awen. Um, Awen. There you go. I love the way she described it as like a, it mutates. That that was really a very good uh, description. It mutates. It it. it it takes the core pieces and it, you know, this little piece changes and this little piece changes and this little piece changes. And they'll say, oh, hey, we got a whole new, re you know, a whole new religion. No, you know, you just got a few little <laughs> evolved pieces, right? And, but, but it's the same thing. It just cycles over and over and over and over. And I think today, you know, I think we can say safely today, we're in probably like the 11th or 12th cycle Oh, of yeah. this ideology, right? And the message of William Branham, if you back up, that's more like the eighth or ninth cycle of this same ideology. And it has just iterated over and over and over again. Um, and it sucks people in and they think, oh, we've got this new thing from God. And they don't even realize this is just the same regurgitated stuff happening over and over again. 
Yeah, it's funny. I've got this guy who hounds me in the comment feeds and sends emails. He tries to disconnect the word of faith from Branhamism because he's stuck <laughs> in the world word of faith. <laughs> Apparently, mm-hmm. the cult that they're in has not progressed into some of the newer stuff, their word of faith weirdness. And it's funny because it wasn't until you and I were going through towards the end of the podcast we did on the Branham history that it really clicked for me that Word of Faith was basically had just spun off from Branhamism. And the thing that sealed the deal, man, (laughs) is T.L. Osborne, the statements he made at the funeral. I mean, he's saying William Branham is God in the flesh. And he says, I don't care if you think it's sacrilegious that I think Branham was God in the flesh. And even that, I knew that he had said that. What I didn't know, and it didn't click until you know, you mentioned it, but he's saying it right there at the convention of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Association. They're all there. They're all there. And you don't find not one single rebuke of T.L. Osborne for this. Instead, yeah. they lift him up on this platform and say, here's our guy. He's one of the, the apostles of the word of faith. You're exactly right, John. And I mean, and there's just no, there is no question. I mean, the founders of all that outright said we learned this from William Branham and F.F. F. Bosworth at the revivals. I mean, it's not even a question that that's where it comes from. You know, T.L. Osborne, <laughs> Roberts Laird and interviewed T.L. Osborne and said, hey, where'd you learn this? From William Branham and F.F. <laughs> F. Bosworth, who had a chapter about E.W. Kenyon in their book. Like, it's not even a question where this stuff comes from. And you hear people argue about all this, that it's all... It is amazing how this ideology brainwashes people and how they get so trapped into this mythical view that does not exist. And it and and their whole world is so built on that that they they don't want to look down. Right. Because if you look down. Oh, it's sinking sand. They've got to pretend that it's the rock, you know, that they're and it, it's it's sad. And, you know, and of course, John, you and I coming from this similar background, I mean, we I can totally understand why people are like that because it is so painful i mean it is so hard it is absolutely life-shattering to realize that this foundation you've built your life on was a hoax and you have been a victim for 20 30 40 50 years some of these 60 70 years you have been built your life on a hoax and it is uh it's so sad and unfortunate but it it's very sadly very sadly, the truth for a whole lot of people. And it's never too late to wake up. And, you know, what I tell people, John, on this side, um, all the people who are, you know, I work with, you know, it, it's unfortunate we did have a false prophet. But just because William Branham was a false prophet, you know, it's good news. Jesus is still a real savior. So <laughs> we yeah. can throw away him away. You know, we can throw away our false prophet and we can keep our real savior and be just fine, I think. So. Yeah. You know, it's it's a lot like going to a cosplay convention where you start to believe in the thing that you're playing and then you realize that it's you're in the middle of a Stephen King novel and this is <laughs> this is not a good thing that you're in. I remember waking up from that. That's uh, there are there are many ways, many emotions that I have, and there's many ways I describe it. But I think that was the general feeling. It's like I knew all along that. I they're inwardly deep inside. I did not believe the nonsense because there's a part of your brain that will critically think, even if you're under the mind control. And once you escape, you realize you recognize that that was always there. It's just that you are suppressing that inward thought. Your your authentic self was being suppressed by the mind control. And then after you wake up, you're like, why did I do that? <laughs> you know, I'm smarter than that. Why was I? Why was I like this? And it's there's so many emotions you go through when you leave. I think another thing that is is particularly hard, um, you know, especially when you uh, the higher up you go in this movement, the more you become an accomplice to the things that go on, and and leaving this sort of a movement, especially when you're at a higher level in it. It's more than just acknowledging that, hey, I got tricked and believe some silly things. Um, it also becomes um, having to look at yourself and say, wait a minute, not only was I tricked, not only did I believe some silly things, I did some bad stuff in the name of these silly ideas. I hurt some people in the name of these silly ideas. I enabled people to be hurt in the name of these silly ideas. And... There's a lot of people who that is 
true in big and different ways in their lives. And because they have, would have to admit that, not just necessarily they'd even have to admit it out loud, but they'd have to admit it to themselves. And they can't deal with the pain or the truth of admitting to themselves that not only was I tricked and deceived, but being tricked and deceived, I have now lost this justification for all of these things that I have done. And I now have to look at some of them and realize, hey, these were these were bad things I did. And coming to grips with that is is hard for a lot of people, you know, because there are the truth is there are a lot of really damaged lives that have come out of this that people on the inside are in varying ways been accomplices to. Um, so that, that is one of the, the pains of, of waking up from this is, is confronting that reality. Yeah. And it's all part of the process. You know, when you go when you leave one of these cult groups and then you get into a real church, there is a strong means to help the people grow inwardly. There's a par there's a process of refinement where you become a better person and you constantly evaluate yourself to make sure that you're headed in the right direction. And when you do something that hurt someone, you reflect on it and you change your ways, you become better. But in these cult groups, there is no self-reflection. It's all pointed to the leader instead of yourself. And you're supposed to become more like the leader. Well, in almost every cult group that prob actually every cult group that exists, there's an authoritarian figure who has gone mentally insane and they are just outwardly narcissistic, you know, I, I, there's a lot of words that I could use that I won't against these people, but they're insulting people. And that's the that's the mannerisms of William Branham. So when you're in these cults, especially the Branham cults, you're trained to insult other people. And that for me, when I left, I was shocked that I had become like this because we had this righteous in indignation that we were better than other people and we became even more elite if we could say something bad about somebody else because whatever they were doing that didn't agree with our cult rules. You're, you're exactly right, John, you know, and William Branham um, patterned out that behavior for his followers to follow, right? If you look through his through his life, I, I actually cataloged a fair bit of that to try and point it out to people in the book, Come Out of Her, My People. And for example, when you look at William Branham's falling out with A.A. A. Allen, William Branham publicly attacked and harassed A.A. A. Allen in his sermons for five months straight. Nearly every single sermon he was attacking A.A. A. Allen in his sermon. Five months straight. That's not normal. That's not healthy. That's not appropriate. But that is a pattern he set up. And so then people, message preachers, follow his corrupt pattern, and they think nothing to attack the same person over and over again for five months in a row in sermons, right? It, and he sets these things up, and he, his enemies, their hogs, their dogs, their cows, their pit, you know, their Jezebels, their Ahabs, he just sets all of this up in such a way that people feel justified to do and say really reprehensible things. And William Brown would do it to his own family. Like, that's another thing I think maybe a lot of people didn't catch. William Branham was this way towards his own family, right? You look at the stories he would tell about Billy Paul. I'm right, and of course, Billy Paul, we know he was what he was in there, but he would tell stories. He basically trashed Billy Paul's reputation of the entire cult while he was alive, right? He, he, Sarah Branham, um, he basically said Sarah Branham was possessed by the devil one time trying to destroy his ministry from childhood, right? He says things like this. He would throw his wife under the bus. God cursed her with cancer because she back talked to me. He, nobody was safe, right? And, and when you follow a man who will just trash his own family in front of a, a crowd of, you know, a thousand people, Right. You start to think, oh, that's normal behavior. I don't feel bad to do that sort of thing. But it wasn't OK. It wasn't OK when William Branham did it. It's not OK when they do it today. It's not OK to to just harass people and viciously attack people and degrade people just for the sake of your own popularity or the sake of your own power or your own protection or whatever it is to one up to get even with your enemies. It's not OK to do that. But that, that is exactly what William Branham modeled his behavior, and it's the same thing we see happen with a lot of different leaders in this movement, I hate to say it. 
Well, and the shocking part is that many of these movements that exist today have patterned their ministries after that. And, you know, I didn't realize that. When you look at some of their publications and literature, you know, they always put the people with the smiling faces on the front covers. And so you <laughs> you look at this and you think, wow, those look like really hap happy people in these NAR groups. And we were in this oppressed cult and we were all, you know, when you escape, you realize that you're really sad, but you told yourself that you were happy. Well, <laughs> in talking with these people who have escaped the NAR, it was no different. They just, you know, their their propaganda, their literature that they pass out has the fake smiles too, just like our fake smiles. And people, when they snap out of it and they wake up, they realize that it's like the, you know, the boy who's whistling as he goes through the graveyard trying not to be scared. You're you're putting on this face that isn't really you while you're in these cults. I know it. You know, I the churches I come from, like. The pastor, our, our our central figure after William Branham died, he, he was on the platform next to T.L. Osborne. He was on the platform next to Joseph Matson Bose. He was on the platform next to Kenneth Hagin and these. He was there on the platform with these guys at some of these events, and he was very keen to keep tabs on all of them. And so we were always fairly aware of what was going on among the false anointed ones. <laughs> you, know, John, <laughs> you know how it was in the message, right, John? You know, we were all cons the William Branham labeled all of these guys the false anointed ones. They were they were anointed by God with a false anointing to deceive the masses and blind them with. Yeah, with signs and wonders and miracles to blind them to the truth of the message. And so we kept fairly close tabs on a lot of the false, the, the false anointed ones. And I looked today and I realized, hey, they really were false anointed, but we were, we were just screwed up back then, John, looking at that stuff. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we kept, we kept eye, eye, tabs on what like Paul Kane was up to, what T.L. Osborne was up to, what Kenneth Hagin, what all these guys were up to. We were always aware that we diverged from one another. I mean, we sat on the same platform together, our preachers, yeah. our leaders, right? And it's like really um, breathtaking, you know, to hear some of the people from those movements today pretend like we were never together. I mean, you just don't know what they don't know what they're talking about, John. It's so it's sad. It really is sad. It is. And, you know, it's so backwards, too, because I'm in talking with these people who have escaped the NAR churches, they. They all did the same thing. There was this practice widespread. We're going to keep dirt on the other guy. And so <laughs> it was like spiritual blackmail and sometimes outright blackmail. You had all the dirt. And if somebody was stepping out of alignment or if somebody was going to rise up against you, well, you have the blackmail and you just call them up and say, hey, you do this. And I'm going to tell everybody that you did X, Y and Z. But think of how backwards that would be in a Christian religion where you're supposed to help people become better and help the sinner be saved and all of this. Instead of helping them in the direction that they need to go, you're going to blackmail them instead. This becomes nothing more than a Christian mafia. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I remember when um, Paul Kane and all those guys, the Kansas City Prophets, got going. Hey, we were watching you guys from afar that whole time. I want you to know that. We were. We were watching you guys. Um, as the Toronto Blessing happened and Paul Kane was going to all that stuff and John Wimber and all that stuff was getting going. I mean, we were watching all of that from our churches. Like we, we were, we were observing it. And, and as we would, we would like tick off the box. Look, here's your great falling away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> here's your false anointed ones deceiving the masses. Here's your false revival. Like that is how we, we explained all of that in, in our teachings. And, um, yeah, so I, I think that's part of how we have a little bit of an awareness, I think, of, of, of how those things diverged off that way. But their, their, their belief system is so similar, John. Um, it is so similar, so, so close to being the same. And we would label them all as these are the apostates who have, they have tweaked the truth away from what it really should be. They've compromised themselves away. They don't keep the holiness standards quite right. And now look at what it's created. You know, it's created this mess and yeah i again I, I catalog a little bit of those things here in this book <laughs> <laughs> get the book everybody <laughs> you know and you know there's there's one aspect to it that a lot of people don't think about the same type of people who are attracted to a cult they're often re-victimized and the same type of people who are in the Branham movements are often re-victimized by the 
NAR movements. And this, an example of this is going to come out in the podcast later. I think this one will air before it. But we talked about the Hobart Freeman cult, which that was also a spinoff of the William Branham cult, Splinter Group, yeah. right? And, and and what was the name of Hobart Freeman's church? <laughs> Yeah, the, the Faith Assembly, which is the name and, of the church. And the name of my up. church was yeah, <laughs> Faith it, Assembly. That's not a coincidence, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it, it is not a coincidence. <laughs> and so the Hobart Freeman cult, whenever he died and the cult began to sort of implode, those people went, guess where, Charles? Straight to Kansas <laughs> City for the IHOP church. You got it. Yep. The, this religion primes you that when something goes bad, you say, oh, it was just that leader just got caught astray, and now we've got to go find our real prophet. Oh, hey, there's Mike Bickle. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, know? let's find the oh, other I... guy who. Let's find the other guy who has all the blackmail. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean that that's just how it works, right? You just it treat you. They jump from one to the other to the other to the other, and the truth is, that it's just an un, a lot of it is an unbroken chain of weirdness. I notice one thing with the Kansas City prophets, John, that is a little bizarre to me. They talk about this thing called um, prophetic history. Have you seen that? Yes. <laughs> the prophetic history. What is that? You know, like to me, that's like, that's not even a thing, right? Like you, and you, you catch things like that. And to them, it seems like that's a really big deal. This prophetic history, just like us in the message, we had all kinds of things that was a big deal to us. But at the end of the day, it, it's not even a thing. Like, yeah. Prophetic history is that, I guess that's their new, you know, their equivalent to scripture, I guess, you know, their supplement to scripture, kind of like the spoken word was our supplement to scripture. I don't know, but well, you it's know, unusual. Each, each one of these stories that I'm doing with these people, you know, they're all coming from the same root. So, mm -hmm. I can say that <clears throat> it's all related to what I'm doing, right? But the difference is each splinter group, as it splinters off, they create their own loaded language. And... What they're talking about, it may be the exact same thing as we have different loaded language for, but what these cult leaders do is ingenious because they'll take some idea that William Branham had or somebody along that chain and they'll rebrand it and give it a new name and, oh, yeah. oh the secret thing that we know that none of the other <laughs> Christians know. And what the problem for me is I'm talking to these people, I have no idea what some of these things are. I have to, mm -hmm. as they're talking, I, you, you'll see me turn while I'm recording these podcasts. I'm actually looking up what they're saying so that I can get some frame of reference to that loaded language. <laughs> uh -huh. it, it's ironic, you know, because you, they almost have to do that because the loaded language is, with each generation gets so many negative connotations and baggage associated with it. They got to change it, right? And they can't say, oh, this is Latter Rain 12.0, you know, <laughs> they can't say this is Manifested Gods, you know, 6.4, you know, they, they've they got to have a new, let's call it Dominionism, you know, let's call it Joel's Army, let's call it, um, let's call it Last Day Revival, you know, uh, so the, it just, they, it switch, it, it shifts and shifts and shifts because that baggage associated with the old terms almost forces them to do it. And of course, when they do that, then they can repackage it up just like you say and say, it's brand new, guys. And <laughs> no, it's not brand new. Yeah. There, there's only so much icing that you can put on a... Uh, no, I'm not going to say it. There, there's only so <laughs> there's only so many ways that you can make something nasty look good. I think that's how I say it. <clears throat> you know, we um, since you and I have been recording, we've been going through the podcast with John McKinnon, and he and I discovered that Gordon Lindsay was deeply embedded in a Christian identity. You and I knew that he was in British Israelism, but as we have progressed, we found he was deeply embedded in Christian identity. And then John McKinnon also found that as as, you know, as the two were emerging, the clan and the Christian identity groups, the clan <laughs> that formed this thing called the Supreme Kingdom and the leaders of the Supreme Kingdom in the clan were the same people who planted the, the clan organization in Jeffersonville, Indiana. So yeah. as I'm going through all of this research, I'm starting to understand that <clears throat> You, you look at like the NAR's kingdom theology and you look at the seven mountain mandate, <clears throat> all of these things that they have rebranded. I can go back into time and I can tell you exact movements when they started and <laughs> when they began that the NAR has just, you know, I don't know if they outright plagiarized it or if they just don't realize that they're repeating history as it goes, but they're doing the same exact thing. And I can show a, a 
full history pointing back to those very insidious movements of the early 1900s. Yeah, there there, there comes a, a, a way that this ideology evolves that the leaders know the leaders know they copied it, but the rank and file don't. And with each generation, there there is built into this thing a natural loss of the knowledge of the past where stuff comes from. And as you get two and three and four generations removed, they really are to some extent, I believe, really losing the past of where it came from. But it's important to not do that. It's important to really understand this really is an ideology that really is passing down from people to people that you can put in the same room together saying the same things, right? It's not, it's not a guess or speculation. And, and you're right. I mean, some of the stuff that John McKinnon's unearthed is really incredible, John. Um, when you when John McKinnon turned up that article, that newspaper article of Caleb Ridley um, launching the Jeffersonville chapter of the Ku Klux Klan in 1921, I think. Wow. I mean, that that's that seals so much right there, because that means that the Klan who paid William Branham's hospital bill in 1924 and swooped in to save him was founded by Caleb Ridley, you know, launched with Caleb Ridley, Roy Davis's partner in starting the denomination Pentecostal Assembly, you know, Pen the Pentecostal Baptist Church of God. So he that connects William Branham directly into Roy Davis's orbit from 1924 at this stage. So, I mean, that is, uh, was an amazing find by John oh, yeah. McKinnon. So, hey, a shout out to John if you're listening. John McKinnon, great work. I, I mean, it, I'm fascinated. I'm listening in all that stuff, John, and I really appreciate that you're keeping it going. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And that's the same guy that William Branham's touring with in 1920, what is it, 28, 29, years before he's supposed to have his alleged Pentecostal conversion. He's he's holding Pentecostal revivals with these guys. And, <clears throat> you know, it's it's not just John McKinnon. There's a there's an element where we are sharing truth that has been misrepresented and we're rewriting history that has been written incorrectly. <clears throat> I strongly suspect that many, many leaders of the cult are aware of <laughs> maybe not all, but maybe 80, 90 percent of what's in this book that you wrote. I guarantee you my grandfather knew probably half of what's on these pages, but they cover it up. They try to anything that might make the cult be painted in a bad light instead of saying, we accept that this is the history and that was wrong. They shouldn't have done that in the historical past. We want to become better. Instead, they cover it up. You know, just it, if, if things really did happen, I mean, just say it happened, right? Tell the truth. That way we can learn from it, right? And grow, right? But when you cover it up, you almost doom us to repeat the same mistakes you know, one of the things that I did that is in this book more so than we ever covered in the podcast, John, um, and I'll, I'll I'll go ahead and tell you what it is if you don't want to buy the book, because <laughs> I don't care. Like, I'm not out to make a buck or anything, but I put in here a whole lot about the deity cult, and I, I have worked hard with to trace the origin and show where the deity cult, the deity cult of William Branham, the people who baptized and prayed in William Branham's name come from the heart of the latter rain movement they came out of canada in association with the sharon orphanage they moved to uh to jeffersonville in the 1950s they eventually because william branham gave them power took over all the key institutions of the message and there was a secret cult baptizing and praying in the name of william branham from early on in his ministry right from early on and he played along there's eyewitness testimony of him playing along with it um, even encouraging it privately. And this stuff was going on from very early on in his ministry, right? Um, I don't know. Did I wonder if Kenneth Hagin knew the guy sitting next to him on the platform had his own private entourage that worshipped him as God, right? <laughs> yeah. But there's, there's, there's some evidence, I think, very strong evidence that possibly Paul Kane and T.L. Osborne were somewhat tied into that sort of stuff. Paul Kane, even, I suspect, may have been, given the timings of his moves to Arizona and things that were going on in that point. But they basically even said at different times that William Branham was God in the flesh, speaking these things just like you would hear from the deity cult. And it is really shocking um, 
when you start to put the pieces together and realize that it was William Branham who groomed people to believe that he was the second coming of Jesus. It was William Branham who allowed them to begin worshiping and baptizing and praying in his name. Um, and that he did nothing to arrest it. He let it go on. He let it develop for years. Um, and he also gave all of those people the control over the institutions of the message before he died. It, that is a very shocking thing to to really see the true depth of how that happened. You know, I grew up in churches away from here. We always came back to Jeffersonville to see Grandpa, obviously. But <clears throat> I wasn't aware of the deity cult until I moved here and started attending services more than just once a, once or twice a year. These guys, they traveled with each other. So they were very intimate with understanding everything that was going on. They were right there in the heart of it. When, when I moved to Jeffersonville, not only did I discover that there is a deity cult, there is a group of people in Jeffersonville that actually worship and pray to William Branham's name and the son's name. <laughs> There's actually like it it morphed into a second deity cult. You've got the, the ones that worship the father and the ones that worship the son. And it's not the same father and son that that other <laughs> other Christians worship <clears throat> that exists in Jeffersonville. And everybody knew it. Everybody, because the I'm not going to give any names, but the central figure of the entire message is part of the deity cult in that he knows it and he's not stopping it. And all of these oh, yeah. people are praying directly to him. That's how bad this is. Grandpa knew it. Everybody knew it. I have a hard time believing that these men who traveled with William Branham were not aware. And you don't find a single one of them preaching against it, which means if. You know, if you're going to allow this thing and you're a Christian minister, which this is the deepest, darkest heresy known to man to worship this man as a God. If these people aren't denouncing this thing, either they're not Christian or they want it to progress. Right. And, and you know, when someone gets to the point that they're letting other people worship them as God and encouraging on that belief. I, I mean, I don't see how you can say that they were ever really a Christian, you know, that kind of just is so damning. It's so damning, you know, once they start proclaiming themselves with God. I mean, unless they're some deep mental illness, it, it just, you've almost got to throw out everything they did, you know, once they come to that point. And William Branham was absolutely there. Um, absolutely there. And he didn't get there in the 60s. He was there in the 50s. He was there in the 50s, ladies and gentlemen. Um, he was already there in the 50s. It was just under the covers, you know, hidden behind the scenes. And yes, John, I mean, the institutions of the message are absolutely from the back in those days controlled by members of the William Branham Deity cult. Absolutely. Absolutely. And all you got to do, you just go look at their gravestones <laughs> yeah. in the Eastern <laughs> Cemetery, John. And I mean, it is so they practically have deity quotes on their on their tombstones, even some of them. It, it's shocking. You know, even as a kid, I remember as a kid, we would play and you'd pretend to be some fictional character that you either read in a book or saw in a you know, television, whatever, Davy Crockett, you know, <laughs> as a kid, I would, I would swing through the trees as Tarzan. There's not a, not a chance that you could have got me even as a child to say that I am God. I'm going to pretend to be God because I knew as a child how wrong that was. Think of this, man. As an adult, these men know that this is wrong. Inwardly, they know it's wrong. Why they're doing it, I don't know. But I can tell you that everybody who's involved with this deity cult made a heck of a lot of money. I know one thing, John, that I that I came across that I put in here that I thought was really very illustrative, very illustrative was a, a an article uh, that an advertisement for a book wrote by Gordon Lindsay. And, and the advertisement for this book says the title of the book is Will Elijah Come Again by Gordon Lindsay. Wow. And if you read his little advertisement, he says this book contains a message for this hour. This book contains a message for this hour. And when you see the 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 words around that and you wait and you see Gordon Lindsay advertising this book, you and you're in the message, you start scratching your head. What? Gordon Lindsay knows about a message for this hour? Gordon Lindsay's talking about will Elijah come again? And you know, you get these books and you realize this thing really is just a repeating ideology. You know, like we mentioned earlier. He is taking the exact same 
idea of a, of a coming Elijah to the church out of historic British Israelism. He was born in John Alexander Dowie's commune where these ideas came in through British Israelism. And he regurgitates them. F.F. F. Bosworth came from there. William Branham learned these things. I mean, did William Branham read that book by Gordon Lindsay, Will Elijah Come Again? It has a message for your hour and then decide to go do that. I mean, <laughs> did he? Did he? Because I'll tell you what. Yeah. Will, William Branham never mentioned that there's an Elijah coming in. You have message for your hour before Gordon Lindsay wrote that book. You know what I mean? And you and you realize these there's a common thread in all of this, and and it all it all branches from a from a common root. All of this ideology, all of this idea, whether it's the single forerunner Elijah that we had, whether it's the generation of Elijah stuff that you find that evolved into the the third wave of Pentecostalism, and you know into the New Apostolic Reformation today, it all comes back to common roots in the Pentecostal branch of British Israelism, right? Where the British Israelites who came into early Pentecostalism brought a pre-existing ideology with them. Most of Pentecostalism uh, kicked it in the rear end out the door <laughs> in the 20s, and they landed over in the Foursquare denomination and, and Elam Missionary Fellowship. And then from there, um, it, it was survived just long enough to get into the early days of Latter Rain. Um, from Latter Rain, it kicked off into what we had in the message. Um, and from the message from figures like Paul Kane, who Paul Kane was in the message, for goodness sakes, you know, it just carried on into crazier and crazier and crazier stuff all the way down to this day. And it just keeps going over and over and over again, the same ideology cycling. You know, when I left the cult and I started to understand what was in the Bible without the Bible, without the message lens, and you read like the book of Kings and a great king rose up and he fell to idolatry. Then this other great king rose up and he fell to idolatry. Then another, they fall to idolatry. Well, and then I started piecing together the Pentecostal history and you look in the the roots leading up to William Branham, you've got Dowie rose up as an Elijah, and then he fell to a strong disgrace. You got Frank Sanford as the Elijah, he fell to a disgrace. Charles Fox Parham, he claimed to be an Elijah, he fell. And it just pattern after pattern after pattern. And you just have to ask yourself, what caused this? What made these men decide to do this? Did they really think that they were the the return of Elijah, like they claimed, every one of them made a lot of money off of it. I mean, Dowie, they labeled him the richest man in the West. He had 10, in today's money, it was over half a billion dollars. I, I think the number's like 5.5, um, you know, half, half a billion dollars, basically. <clears throat> but they made all of this money doing it. And you have to wonder, did they really believe it? Or did they just figure out that this is a pattern that makes you so much money that you can get wealth beyond your wildest dreams if you <laughs> if you claim to be Elijah? <laughs> you're, you're right, John. And so for anyone out there who wants to get the book, you can find it on Amazon. Um, you can find it available in French, in English, in Portuguese. If there's anyone out there in the message community and um, – you know of another language that we don't have a lot of English speakers. Re speakers, reach out to me. I'll do my best to get you a translation in that that as well. The cheapest way to get this book, if you have Kindle Unlimited, it's free. Okay, that was the cheapest way I found to get rid of it. <laughs> it's on Kindle Unlimited for free. The ebook is also, you know, pretty cheap. So um, that's that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of it. And I hope it's a useful resource um, to anyone out there. One more plug. One more plug. If I'm working on volume two of it, so I'm working on what comes after William Branham. If there's any message old timers out there who like to talk about what happened in the 70s and 80s, hey, reach out. I, I love talking about message history. I love to bounce ideas off the people that were there just to see because, you know, a lot of things you hear, was it a rumor? Was, it any, was anybody there? And I like to try and figure some of those things out. So I'm always glad to chat to people from the older days who like to talk. And hey, 70s and 80s is coming up next in volume two. Well, on behalf of everybody who has read it and wants to thank you for it, I've got emails that people are, you know, 
really, really excited that they got their new copy and they're getting into it. On behalf of all those people and the people who are going to get it and read it, who want to thank you, I'll say thank you. And um, I'm I'm deep into it myself. I've not made it all the way through because you outdid me. Your your book's a little bit thicker than mine, so <clears throat> I uh, I'm getting into it. And it's uh this is a great read for anybody who wants it. You you got to get Charles's book. It has come out of her, my people, by Charles Paisley, a history of the message of William Branham, volume. One, The Days of the Voice, 1930 through 1965. If you've enjoyed our show and you want more information, you can check us out on the web. You can find us at william-branham.org. For an overview of the historical research of William Branham and the healing revivals, read Preacher Behind the White Hoods, a critical examination of William Branham and his message. Available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. 